Acting Inspector General, U.S. Department of the Interior, who has been with us all morning. And we do appreciate your patience. And you may proceed as you desire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, um, I thank you for the opportunity to testify today about a recent Office of Inspector General report that addresses a number of issues concerning the Minerals Management Service at the Department of Interior. As you well know, we have previously identified programmatic we weaknesses and some egregious misconduct within MMS the latter of which received considerable coverage in the press and scrutiny by this committee, as well as others. In the report released this week, we found more of the same, although the misconduct is dated, arguably less egregious, and considerably less salacious than that in our report issued in 2008 about misconduct in the Royalty and Kind program. As a result, we issued our most recent investigative report according to our routine protocol, providing a copy to the department and requesting a formal response in 90 days, at which point we would provide copies of the report to cognizant committees and post it to our website. Given the events of April 20th of this year, however, this report had become anything but routine. We expedited its release. While I neither condone nor excuse the behavior chronicled in this, our most recent report on MMS, for the most part, the improper conduct of the employees at the Lake Charles District Office preceded the termination of the regional, office, regional supervisor in 2007 for his gift acceptance. And as our report indicates, this behavior appears to have drastically declined. As such, I am more concerned about the environment in which these inspectors operate and the ease with which they move between industry and government. I am also concerned about the conduct of industry representatives, something we also identified in our 2008 report. That they should think it permissible to fraternize and provide federal government employees with gifts after all the media coverage of this practice is hard to fathom but may be informed by the environment as well. While not included in our report, we discovered that the individuals involved in the fraternization and gift exchange, both government and industry, have often known one another since childhood. Their relationships were formed well before they joined either industry or government. MMS relies on the ability to hire employees with industry experience. And in my very brief but intense experience in this arena, the past month or so, the MMS employees that I have met who have come from industry are highly professional, extremely knowledgeable, and passionate about the job they do. As you know, all the OIG reports related to MMS have made headlines, some more sensational than others. This report has done the same. Headlines, however, are not our goal. Rather, our goal has always been and is today to effect positive change. To this end, I must credit the Department for the serious with which it has taken the findings contained in this report and for taking swift action in response to the misconduct and the challenges inherent to the industry government dilemma. As you also know, Secretary Salazar has announced that MMS will be split into two distinct bureaus under the Assistant Secretary for Land and Minerals Management and a third independent office for the collection of royalties under the Assistant Secretary for Policy Management and Budget. As this reorganization progresses, I am hopeful that the Department will incorporate our recommendations for programmatic improvements. These must, however, be bolstered with an emphasis on ethics to include controls and strong oversight. We are pleased with Secretary Salazar's continued emphasis on ethics, and MMS's preliminary response to our most recent report, indicating that it will, among other things, enhance ethics training specifically for its inspectors and establish controls like a two-year waiting period to further ensure ethical compliance. The final element is strong oversight. In the fall of 2008, Inspector General Earl Devaney testified before this committee 
describing what was then a fledgling office within the Office of Inspector General, now called our Royalty Initiatives Group. Since that time, we have also established an investigative unit dedicated to energy issues and have expanded our oversight coverage beyond MMS to the Energy and Minerals Program at the Bureau of Land Management. Until recently, these two offices have been dedicated to the royalties-related oversight and improvements. Since the events of April 20th, it has become increasingly clear that we must expand their scope to providing oversight of the operational, environmental, safety, inspection, and enforcement aspects of energy production on federal lands and in the Outer Continental Shelf. We have begun a multi-pronged effort to address these issues as quickly and thoroughly as possible, including an inquiry into whether or not the ethics issues in MMS have, in fact, ceased. We are also conducting an investigation into the actions of MMF, MMS officials concerning the approval and inspection of the operations on Deepwater Horizon. Beyond these efforts, which are clearly spurred by the immediate urgency of the matter at hand, we will focus on building our oversight capacity beyond royalties into the areas of safety and oversight of drilling operations, both off and onshore. This concludes my prepared testimony today. I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much for your, uh, uh, for your testimony. Um, and uh, uh, the, the work, obviously, by this office and, and certainly uh, the, the testimony early on and the investigations done by Mr. Devaney, I think, pointed out all of the problems that we've discussed here today. And I think they're, they're, they're obviously very important, and I appreciate uh, your telling the committee that you believe that there has been a, a very serious response by the, by, the, uh, by the Secretary and uh, the Assistant Secretary and the Director of MMS uh, with regard to these, because I know that's how this committee, and certainly the Chairman that has led the way uh, on these investigations, we take this very, very seriously. It's, it's taxpayer monies, it's the environment, it's a lot of very serious issues. But I'd like to move, if I can, uh, to on your last page. Uh, I'm chair of Education Labor Committee and deal with OSHA and deal with worker safety, and the chairman and myself just returned from uh, a hearing on, on the coal mine safety and the accident that took place at, at the Big Branch uh, mine. And I know apparently you're now going to be part of a committee that's going to be reviewing safety. Is that correct? Yes, it's the. Um, Are we talking about safety of, in terms of the rigs and the environment, or safety with the tragic loss of life of of, of the 11 workers? It, it covers it covers both. It will cover both. Similar. Yes. Uh, because I think you know, this is a very hazardous industry. Uh, as we see, when things go wrong, they can go wrong in a big, very big way. And that's not to say that, that it, it has, you know, I think there's been a great reduction, or appears to be a substantial reduction in injuries and the rest of that. We'll find that out. But we have a number of industries where that doesn't tell you what can happen when things go wrong. And there are processes in place in other, in other areas, not because not in the mineral management service at the time, but where we, you know, we change the burden of proof when you're engaged in activities or changes within the chemical industry and other places if you're moving around. In this case, they were going to engage in, in, in uh, capping this well. I believe the exploration was done. You're going to get this rig off and bring in a production facility at some time in the, in the future. And I don't know, but I'd really be interested in knowing whether then there's a checklist that people go through about where people are going to be engaged in this process, how is this going to be handled, and whether the, I know the Coast Guard, I don't think does these permanent, these, these rigs, they do ships and vessels, and this I think is a hybrid, it's neither fish nor fowl, but if, in my district, if you were going to shut down a refinery, you'd go be going through a checklist of, of what's going to take place during that time, just as if you were going to restart that refinery. And I would just hope that you would, look at this in terms of the events that take place on these rigs where you may want people to stop and think about now how's this transaction going to take place and uh, it could be as small as you know loading and unloading cargo it can be whether or not you're going to cap a well and and and, and try to uh, uh, you know change out 
uh, drilling for production. Does this Am I making any sense to you? You're looking at me yeah, like no, yes, sir, you not. are. Um, and, and, it wouldn't be the first time I wouldn't have looked at me like I wasn't <laughs> no, making any sense. No, I. I, but I think it's a very serious concern. You know, I put, put on our other hats. We lost 11 people uh, on this rig, and we're starting to get some information about what took place. And it, it's not what you'd like to be the regular order, uh, given the, the transaction that they were going through and swapping out this well. Absolutely, part of the. Um, responsibility of this oversight board is to be informed by what it learns from the investigation and I think we have learned a great deal. Um, the, the next question becomes what needs to be done in terms of improvements in the process in MMS's oversight and the like. Um, the the um, What I identified as, as our next task which is to send out Office of Inspector General teams to really dive into these areas and bring back information probably to be reviewed by a series of experts since we do not have that technological expertise in our office but we do have the capability to go out, collect information quickly, make a quick analysis and present it through the Safety Oversight Board to the Secretary who then will probably um, employ a series of experts either from the National Academy of Engineering or from the President's Commission to review this information. And if I can just finish up, so the thinking is that this would then be incorporated into the discussions of the reorganization of the architecture of, of MMS, maybe even the Coast Guard and or whatever, whatever I, else. I would certainly hope so, yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's very helpful. Uh, gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Castro. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. There's a little bit of a mixed message from your report. You speak about concern that folks have known each other so long they fraternize. On the other hand, you speak of the high level professionalism of among the people you met. Presumably some of the folks you met were those who were, who were fraternizing. So is it the fraternizing per se or et cetera? You see where I'm going with that. I, I, I do. Um, the fraternizing certainly is not acceptable, but one of the Maybe one of the weaknesses is a weakness in the ethics um, regulations which allows gift acceptance if it's based on a personal relationship. But, but I think gifts are allowed to be if there's a pre-existing relationship. So if two kids went to Sulphur High School, they both go to petroleum engineering at LSU or Texas A&M or one of the, because there's not that many petroleum engineering schools. And so there, you know, there's going to be one or two degrees of separation between everybody in the field. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes, it does. Uh, so, so it almost seems uh, we're, uh, uh, if, they're, if, if, they, if they played on the state championship team at Sulphur High School in 1971 and now they're in industry, one's regulatory, one's private, is that the type of fraternizing you're concerned about? It, it is simply because it, it is, if you look at the gift giving um, regulations, it would be in violation of the gift giving regulations which are designed not only to affect or prevent real effect over an, a government employee's job and how he or she... Um, now the fraternizing, I, I see your points, I don't mean to interrupt, I just have limited time, I'm sorry. The fraternizing obviously is important. Do you have any, uh, potentially, but potentially not, because again I'm struck that you say that the level of professionalism and motivation among the career employees was great. So it tells me on the one hand they may know each other, but they still may be willing to throw the other into the pokey if they're doing a bad job. Do you have any data on the year-by-year -year number of infractions and the intensity of the infractions that have been uh, meted out, if you will, by the late Charles office or other offices in the Gulf of Mexico? I do not. Because that seems like that's critical. I mean, if you have a correlation where a, in fact, I'm a little surprised you don't. If you, if you, there should be a correlation, what you're alleging, but kind of, I'm a little schizophrenic, is that because of the fraternizing, there are people who are going lighter on. But on the other hand, there's still a level of professionalism. That's I, in the, that's in the, both those statements are in your testimony or report. But on the other hand, the real, the real issue is, is it impacting enforcement? Well, we did not find a quid pro quo involved in this 
investigation. When where's... you say this, you mean the Deepwater Horizon? No, no, I'm sorry. The and Lake in your Charles, IG report. The Lake Charles um, investigation. We did not find quid pro quo either in this or in the MMS um, investigation that we conducted out on the Royalty and Kind group. But the there is a clear violation of the ethics regulations in the acceptance in both instances. So, so I'm not, I'm not, put it this way, I think there's a lot of attention and there's almost a presumption that if there is a violation of the ethics code, that in some way it's impacting the implementation or the enforcement of regulations. But what I think I'm hearing from you is that what we're really concerned about is a violation of the ethics code, but that violation does not seem to have had an impact upon enforcement. Well, I don't know if it had an impact. It did not, we did not find quid pro quo kind of examples. Um, you, your suggestion that we look at the, the data of the inspection um, frequency and, and extent, I think, is a good one. Uh, now, it also seems to me that you're going to have a very hard time in the future monitoring. Uh, let me back up a little bit. I'm struck that the, um, uh, the uh, advanced permit to drill, the APD, is supposed to be MMS's ability to sign off on a drilling plan. In effect, doing what Mr. Miller was speaking of, uh, signing off on the safety, the plan, is it wise, is it not? Now, was that not done in this case? Or put it this way, is that not done regularly? Because APDs theoretically prevent accidents by saying, stop, you can't do that because that's not safe. Uh, do, do, do you see where I'm going with that? I, I'm not sure I do. Um, APDs are, they must be approved by MMS. I don't know the technicalities involved in the APD process, so I really can't speak to that. Okay. Now, it also seems like, again, there's going to be one degree of separation between every petroleum engineer in the United States. It's going to be a relatively small sorority fraternity, if you will. And so if you're going to have a safety board which is going to actually begin to go out and do oversight, either you're going to put people in a box and you're not going to let them go to an LSU football game, which would be a terrible tragedy for all of us, uh, or you're going to say, well, listen, you know the guy. You went to grad school together. And now he's earning three times as much as you in the private sector and you're, you're, you're in the public sector, but somehow we're not going to let you transition. It almost seems inherent in this smallness of this industry is the problems which you detail. Well, I, I think you're right, but the, the simple fix would be Go to the LSU game and pay your own way. Oh, that's absolutely true. Uh, that's absolutely true. But I, I'm going back to what you said, how many of these people have pre-existing relationships, mm -hmm. and somehow we're supposed to put a Chinese wall between them once they go into the regulatory environment. Uh, I, don't, I don't think that's what I'm, what I'm saying. I'm saying that you, you remove the appearance of favoritism and impropriety if you stop the gift giving. People can be friends. Can and I ask one more question? And so in your follow-up report, will you do an analysis of the, again, uh, numbers of infractions and the uh, severity of infractions uh, meted out um, uh, over different time periods? Uh, we, we could certainly do that. Um, the director of MMS may be able to give you that information more quickly than I can. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, oh, okay. Let, let me ask my questions here first. Uh, Thank you very much for the work that you've done. Uh, this report is uh, rather detailed and extensive, and uh, certainly it took a long, lot of long hours, and we appreciate it. You may have heard me uh, earlier, since you've been here all morning, uh, mention to the Secretary that, you know, as much as we'd like to see it in a perfect world, we're never going to have 100 percent honesty, integrity, purity, if you will. Uh, that's just impossible to legislate or uh, uh, make happen. Uh, my, my question, I guess, is uh, my thought first is that you need st stiffer penalties in order to make it as little as possible what has occurred here. Uh, but what recommendations do you make? I'm not sure, for example, breaking the MMS up into three different uh, departments uh, or agencies or whatever you want to call it is going to address the problems that you have addressed uh, in your report. So, what recommendations? Uh, would you make to the secretary or have you made to the secretary or to MMS uh, to address the problems that you found? Well, we have made a number of recommendations as we've gone along. Most have to do with strengthening ethics requirements and More ensuring... More than what the secretary has already promulgated upon his taking Yes, off. and ensuring that, that that in fact has happened. And 
part of the effort that we'll be undertaking um, in the next couple months will be to ensure that that, in fact, has occurred. Um, the other is I think that the, the secretary can take some very short-term measures like the instituting a two-year waiting period on inspector say who comes from Shell, moves to MMS, should not be allowed to inspect a Shell platform or rig for at least two years. There is no waiting period now? I don't believe so, no. So that kind of measure is a fairly simple measure that can be taken almost immediately without legislation, without change in even regulation, but could be done even by just internal guidance or secretarial order. The, in response to the earlier questioner, you had mentioned the uh, uh, exceptions for personal hospitality, you know, people that have known each other their whole lives, went to high school together and all that, uh, that there's an exception there, much like afflicts us or affects us as members of Congress, we have that personal hospitality exemption rule. Is that the same type of uh, rule that it, it is. It's a, it's a specific exception to the gift rule in um, the Office of Government Ethics regs. Okay. Um, the recommendations that you make uh, include, well, let me, on, on that last point I just addressed, we, though, have a ban on if we leave service in the con Congress there is, I think, a one-year ban or maybe two-year ban before we can go a lobbyist, so to speak. So uh, I'm surprised to hear that there is no such waiting period for MMS. Well, there are similar bans going from government to industry. Um, but it also depends on how, how involved you are in a particular matter. Um, there are all sorts of, of elements that go into whether there's a lifetime ban, a two-year ban, or a one-year ban. But that addresses going from government to industry, not industry to government. Okay. Uh, your report notes that on October 15th, 2009, the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Western District of Louisiana declined to prosecute the issues raised by your investigation. The U.S. Attorney there at the time was Donald Washington, a Bush administration appointee. Could you tell us why he failed to prosecute? Mr. Chairman, the U.S. Attorney's offices um, exercise a great deal of discretion, and oftentimes we will not get a specific reason in, in their exercise of that discretion. My recollection in this one was that they said there was a lack of prosecutorial merit. Lack of prosecutorial And sometimes that means, um, in, in some districts, in my experience, it may mean it hasn't reached a particular dollar threshold. Um, for fraud cases, it may not reach um, another kind. I mean, for instance, the, the U.S. Attorney's Office in Billings, Montana, is going to probably have a lower um, dollar threshold than the U.S. Attorney's Office in Los Angeles. Um, those are the kinds of, of elements that go into their decision, and we are bound by them. Have there been other cases where the U.S. Attorney has failed to prosecute? Oh, yes. Okay. Uh, General Agent Wyoming, Ms. Lewis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you for attending today. Absolutely. Uh, first question, are, are you actively investigating the department's response to the explosion? Whether it was immediate, wh whether there were failures in pre preparation or response to the explosion? What, what we are looking at are Emma, MMS's role leading up to the explosion. Um, there is a, an MMS team who has expertise. Um, unfortunately, my office does not have technical expertise to look into the, the root cause of the explosion, but what we're trying to determine is MMS's role up to the explosion and when the, whether there was any um, contributing action, inaction, or conduct that that had some effect on the resulting disaster. Okay. Um, r regarding back to the discussion about uh, MMS employees social socializing with oil company executives, is that unique to the MMS or is 
are there rules against that kind of socializing uh, within the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service or the Park Service or any other agency within the Department of the Interior to prevent socializing between contractors or regulated uh, businesses and, uh, and the regulator? The, the rule is not against socializing per se, it's against acceptance of gifts, which usually come by way of buying a meal, um, paying for a round of golf, a uh, ticket to LSU um, championship game. It's the acceptance of gifts, not the socialization that's, that's being regulated. And do the new ethics rules that uh, have been enacted for MMS apply across agencies within the Department of the Interior, or are they specific to the MMS? The, the preliminary response that we've received from MMS has suggested that they will implement ethics training specific to their inspectors to address the kinds of issues that we raised in this report relative to the gift giving between industry and government, but people who also happen to be close friends. That's sort of an anomaly for MMS. Okay, so for the time being, these new ethics rules just apply to MMS? The ones that they're proposing, yes. And I, I believe so. I'd want you to confirm that okay. with Ms. Burbao. Um, are there other agencies within the Department of the Interior that have ethics rules? Oh, we're all bound by ethics rules. All bound by the same ones that are issued out of the Office of Government Ethics. And were they inadequate to serve MMS's situation? Is that why a unique set of ethics rules has been enacted that applies only to MMS? No, I think the, the problem is with this exception for close personal friendships, it didn't, I don't know that OGE envisioned when they put these regs together in, I want to say the late 80s, that they envisioned this kind of um, problem. So I think it is somewhat unique to MMS. There may be other government entities who have the same kind of relationships with industry that it may apply to as well, but I'm not aware of any. Well, and I, I suspect that there are regulatory relationships um, with businesses, for example, at EPA, uh, where a regulator may be inspecting a refinery uh, for whom they formerly worked and vice versa. How do those agencies handle it? In other words, have you looked to other regulatory relationships within government where there is a flow of employees between the regulated community and the regulator community to find out if there's a good model? No, we haven't, but that would be, I think, a very good suggestion. Uh, you stated in your testimony, can I, oh, you stated in your testimony that you're conducting a review of the status on non-producing DOI leases at the request of Congress. Um, can you provide us with a copy of the letter outlining the parameters of the request? That actually is a, a relatively old request. It was a request made by um, then Chairman Dix of our Appropriations Committee, um, and that report was issued, I want to say, about a year ago. The request was, Chen? The, the report, the actual the report, report okay. was. Um, and do we have a copy of that report, Mr. Chairman? Or It's available on our website. Over. But I could certainly provide it to the committee if, if you wish. Even if you just provide the uh, where we can go to review. I'd be glad to do That'd that. That'd be great. Um, did you in that report look at an analysis of the loss of revenue to states and the federal treasury that results from uh, the regulatory processes that might be not only improved for efficiency uh, but also expedited? That was not within the scope of what we looked at, no. Okay. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, gentleman from uh, Arizona, Mr. Grijalva. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you, Ms. Kendall. Uh, and I was glad to hear, and correct me if I heard wrong, uh, that, that part of uh, the enhanced role of your office will be looking at, at BLM as well? Yes. Well, that's good. Appreciate that. Uh, 
We heard from the Secretary and from Mr. Hayes that part of, part of the problem, uh, at least I interpreted that that's what they said, part of the problem is this rush to judgment, that we must get these requests, these applications per, permitted and out, i.e., I have 30 days to do environmental assessments. Uh, the Secretary's extended it in 90 days. I don't believe that's enough. Uh, did you, in your look at MMS, see that as a, as a pressure point for maybe not conducting the oversight? or That's something we will be looking at, both in terms of the role of MMS and then our contribution to um, what the Secretary has requested in terms of looking forward where we can find um, better practices, gaps in regulations or, or procedures, and that sort of thing. I think we would certainly include that in, in what yeah, we're going I, to do I, I, I looking think, forward. You know, I, would, I would be curious to see if there was ever a denial mm -hmm. of a permit for drilling based on an environmental assessment, uh, uh, EIS, they're done regionally. I believe they should done, be done specific to the site. Uh, and, uh, but I'm just curious to see if there's ever one denied. And, and of the categorical waivers, of which 26 have occurred after, after the spill, uh, those again are, there was, the point being made is that we're rushed to make these things happen because of the legislation. And maybe that's one area in which Congress does have a role. Yes. Well, it it certainly is, is envisioned in what we'll be looking at. And the restructuring, given the relationship issue, uh, given the fact that much of the oversight responsibility is with MMS, but also the royalty collection is with them as well, given that in the restructuring that the Secretary talked about, is that enough to fully restructure and reform this agency that has been persistently a problem? I don't know that there's any single right answer to, to resolving the concerns about MMS. I think going forward, however, if there is not only a focus on the restructuring, but sort of the re, reforming the, the character and culture. How do you culture. transform that culture? That's part of the question. You know, I think you can restructure, but there's a transformation that needs to happen. I think the chairman spoke to that as well. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it worries me that we're just going to do window dressing restructuring and the fundamental root cause is going to remain the same. I, I don't have a simple answer. I'm, I simply don't. And the last is the oversight staffers at MMS are being oversighted by who? Who? <laughs> Who has oversight responsibility over the oversight folk that are in MMS? Um, there, are, there are two levels of oversight, I think. Certainly one of them is my office, the Office of Inspector General. Um, MMS also has an audit function um, contained inside of MMS. My understanding is they audit primarily the royalty um, aspects of MMS but they may have um, an audit function over the operational, the, the inspection function as well. Yeah, I, I, thank you. I, 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 I don't think it's, I don't think the issue is do I know somebody and do I go with somebody to a football game? Mm -hmm. I think the issue is the kinds of regulatory ethical parameters that we need to establish for that agency. And uh, so I want to thank you very much for your work. Yield Thank back, you. Mr. Chairman. Gentleman from California, Mr. Costa. Thank you very much. Um, I, I assume, as the Auditor General or the Inspector within the Department of Interior, you perform audits on all the various uh, agencies within the department. Yes. Have you attempted, in light of what has been ongoing now for several years, as you cited in your own testimony? any comparative analysis as to how, uh, I mean, sadly, uh, MMS doesn't have a very good reputation for a combination of reasons that we've all discussed, but 
is it uh, is this the worst uh, in your observations of, of of the others within the uh, I mean is it average or there more of uh, I mean how many personnel we're talking about here 1700 did I hear the number correct that's what I understand yes 1700 personnel in, in MMS um, Congressman Costa the department is made up of almost 72,000 employees. My office um, has approximately 200 auditors and investigators mm -hmm. to oversee. That's a big job. I understand that. But I'm just trying to get some sort of comparative analysis. I mean, when we talk about a, a culture of corruption uh, or that it's endemic and we're trying to figure that out, uh, I mean, there's a lot of other uh, um, agencies that perform, perform similar roles. I'm just trying to get a sense of is, is this the exception? I would say that MMS has unfortunately received most of the, the publicity, but certainly the other bureaus have challenges in them, some more than others. Um, but s certainly these were issues that, and I, I want to cite um, Inspector General Devaney. Um, this is a this is a department that has everything that people want. They want the minerals, they want the land, they want the oil, they want the water. And so the, the kinds of issues that I think we find in this department may be somewhat different than we might find my former agency was EPA. And I don't remember the kinds of findings from the Inspector General at that agency like we have, have here. So, I don't know that I can say better or worse. I'd just say different. Okay. Uh, you explained uh, in your testimony how you're being brought into this discussion as it relates to um, the uh, application of the reorganization. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, uh, it, it, you view this within the, the department as a work in progress? I mean, are they continuing to receive your input? Yes. and, and let me let me clarify. We are not trying to influence how the department chooses to reorganize. reorganize but are you what making we are, recommendations? Well, what we're trying to do is inform in areas where our work would suggest that as they go forward with the reorganization, that they look at issue areas to make sure that practices are in place or policies are in place to ensure that they don't repeat some of the some of the mistakes that we've identified in the well, past. Let's take that as an example in trying to tr determine oversight and mm -hmm. capability. If we divide, uh, as is being proposed, the collection of royalties and, well, that program is going to be eliminated, but the collection of, of, of fees and, and, and so forth from the inspection part of the process on some, I think, Under Secretary Hayes quoted 1,800 plus deep water uh, wells and 38,000 shallow wells. I mean, you just begin to think of those numbers out in the Gulf, and I've been out there with the chairman. It's a, it's a very large responsibility. Uh, I mean, you certainly, uh, with those amount of wells, would, would be very challenged to have a person, a inspector on each individual well. Um, so, what kind of proposing racials or recommendations are you making? Are you, are you getting to, into that level of, of detail? I, we may be in this next effort that we're undertaking, but the focus there is more on s safety and environmental issues. Um, and I think what, what you're suggesting with the number of wells and the royalties aspect of managing royalties from those wells, um, they're different from the health and safety and No, I understand, issues. but I mean, one of the areas that was cited in your, in your report mm -hmm. was as inspection sheets uh, on these rigs that uh, mm -hmm. simply were handed to their friend who knew someone mm -hmm. who said, hey, why don't you guys mm -hmm. fill this out? we assume that you're running a good operation and... In fact, that was the allegation that we received. That did not bear out. In fact, we found that 
what was happening is the inspectors were actually filling the forms out themselves in pencil, coming back and filling them out in pen. We did not find any instances in which they handed them to industry, said, you fill it out, and then they basically signed it. So that never happened? It, we did not find any instances of that. Okay. All right. Time's expired. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. We'll look forward to your continued input as the subcommittee holds hearings in the in the next month. Thank you. Gentleman from New Mexico, Mr. Henry. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Ms. Kendall, you mentioned uh, one recommendation of, I believe, a two-year waiting period or something between, I guess, people moving from uh, regulated to regulator and vice versa. Um, but as you discussed uh, a little bit earlier, Part of the issue here is that when, when you grow up with the kind of close relationships um, that really start long before even your professional career does, it, it's much harder to know where to draw that line. Do you have any other recommendations? Are there training recommendations or, or um, other ideas for how to make it abundantly clear um, to create some, some direction there so that the, the fundamental cultural issues become very well defined and people know exactly where to draw the line. Well, let me give credit where it's due. Um, it was MMS's response to our report that outlined this two-year waiting period. Um, but I, what you're suggesting, I think, would be in a, a training, um, an education kind of concept. And I, one of the other things that MMS responded to us was to develop a, a specific ethics training course for their inspectors to address this very kind of issue. And I think we can't govern human behavior by regulation or rule, but um, if, if you can be very specific in terms of the expectations and be clear about those, I think we will be in a much better position. Thank you. Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, I thought that I heard Secretary Salazar say in his testimony this morning specifically that it was MMS employees who allowed industry representatives to fill out the forms in pencil and then the MMS employees went in later and filled them out in pen, giving the appearance that it was MMS employees who were in collusion or deferring their responsibilities to inspect to industry, thereby creating a fox in the hen house scenario. Um, and I, uh, if I heard correctly, uh, I was tremendously alarmed by that. I'm now hearing from you that that allegation did not prove to be true. Um, I, uh, Mr. Chairman, I think we, that we should go back and look at uh, Secretary Salazar's testimony. And if it turns out that he was mistaken, uh, we should ask him to correct his statement uh, prior to, to it being permanently memorialized because that m maligns the agency unfairly if he, you know, inadvertently or mistakenly believed that allegation to have been true. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I, I know I heard that in this hearing room. I don't remember who it was attributed to. I also know that there have been press um, reports making the allegation the actuality, when in fact, I think a careful reading of our report would suggest that that was the allegation. We did not find it to be substantiated. Well, Mr. Chairman, and, and, and I don't recall who said it either this morning, but I think it's important, regardless of who said it, that we make some sort of correction uh, t to make clear that, that that was not the case. I, I think that incorrectly maligns uh, the MMS inspectors, uh, and that has been disproven by the current testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would note that uh, in the report, of which I'm reading this specific language, uh, there were found out of 556 files that were reviewed 
uh, for any alteration of pencil and ink markings, notations, or signatures, we found a small number with pencil and ink variations. The report goes on, however, we cannot discern if any fraudulent alterations were present on these forms. Uh, according to the lead MMS inspector, MMS inspectors often use pencil to complete inspection forms. He said that anyone from MMS involved in the platform inspections could author the, author the inspection form and inspectors routinely signed each other's names on the forms. Is that accurate? Yes, sir. Okay. Gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Kant. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Kendall, thank you very much uh, for being here in your testimony, and, and thank you and your entire staff at the Inspector General's Office for the service you're doing on behalf of the American people. I, mean, I think it's clear from starting with Mr. Devaney's earlier report a couple of years back to the most recent one that there was desperate need of sunshine being let into the MMS offices and the conduct that was, uh, that was occurring there. And it's not just Houston we have a problem, or Denver we have a problem, but now Lake Charles office we have a problem, and on and on. Now the Secretary was here and, and testified today what steps uh, the Department have taken in response to this and other activities uh, over the past year or so with the new administration, and also announced the restructuring of MMS, dividing that up, new ethical standards. In your opinion, the steps that are being taken now by the Secretary and the Department of Interior uh, is this moving in a very helpful direction in order to avoid the type of circumstances that you've highlighted in the report and Mr. Devaney did in his, in his previous report? I think they have a very challenging job in front of them. Um, I think that the, the way that the Secretary has proposed dividing MMS makes sense. I'm not sure that just by virtue of that division you're going to solve the really sort of human nature problems, but it is certainly a step in the right direction. You know, that's what kind of jumped out at me in glancing at your report that you had submitted, that you were particularly concerned with the ease in which uh, the federal inspectors move between industry and government, and I assume from government to industry to this idea that there's a revolving door uh, taking place. And it's not just Department of Interior, I think it's throughout the federal government that we've got a problem. And I know folks back home in western Wisconsin think that there has been a too cozy relationship between those in charge of oversight and the industry in which they're supposed to be overseeing. And I think it's true for previous administrations. There have been a lot of political appointment, appointees made for, uh, from people from these very industries that they're going in now to conduct oversight functions over. And I don't know if, in your opinion, based on the investigations and the information you've been able to uncover, whether we need more bright line rules in order to get at this revolving door, door culture that I think has been existing for too long without doing it in a way that jeopardizes the type of expertise and the type of professionalism that you want in these offices at the same type, time. That, I think you hit it right on the head. That's exactly the balance that is difficult to strike. Um, you make the, the restrictions too onerous and government won't have the benefit of any of the kind of expertise it needs. Um, industry will buy it away um, almost all the time. Um, I, I think there is a balance um, to be had. I don't know if, if we've got that specifically in the regulations, but I think some of the steps that MMS is proposing to take certainly goes a long way in, in striking that balance. Let me ask you a couple factual questions, and you can correct me, but it was my understanding that in, in MMS there were bonuses given out to the employees for expediting lease approvals. Is, is that something that you're familiar with? It is not. Okay, so I may be asking the wrong person about that. There was also a memorandum back in 2005 uh, with MMS that there was an assumption that the private industry would best know the environmental impacts of any project or any operation that they were undertaking. And that, I think, influenced kind of MMS's review of the environmental impact on projects. Were you familiar with that 2005 memorandum and whether it's still in existence today? Unfortunately, excuse me, unfortunately I'm not. Okay. Well, we'll have to do some independent follow-up with the agency itself then uh, to find it. Uh, but you, you had explained that you know, this is an inherent problem, I think, even with elected officials, with the past relationships that you might have had with 
uh, people in the past, friendships, and I think you point that out very well in the report and how difficult it is to straddle that line between personal friendships and the job that you're entrusted to do. But finally, with the, the type of abuses that were uncovered by Mr. Devaney and also you, uh, were there any consequences uh, to the MMS employees, but also to the private industry representatives who got caught with the meals and the football tickets and things of that nature? There were to the MMS employees. Um, in the 2008 report, my that was one of our concerns. Are there any consequences right. to the to the industry folks who are involved in this? And my answer, I think, is no. Well, do you think we ought to be considering as a committee enhanced penalties for um, private industry representatives engaged in this type of conduct? Well, I think any penalties, perhaps. I don't know that there are any that exist at all. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. General Aiden Virgin Allen, Dr. Christensen. I, I don't have any questions, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the main question was asked by my colleague right here. Okay. Uh, Mr. Kendall, let me ask you one last question. Uh, in your report, in your investigation, you say two MMS employees at the Lake Charles office admitted to using illegal drugs during their employment at MMS. And if there's two admissions, obviously there could be many others as well. Uh, my question is, any way of telling if any inspector on this rig, I know, recognize Deepwater's only been around since the first of the year, but nevertheless this rig has been around for some time. Uh, that could date back to the years of your investigation. Any way of telling uh, if this rig in which 11 people lost their lives and others injured had been inspected by an MMS employee on drugs? I, I don't know the answer to that, Mr. Chairman. I do know that the Deepwater Horizon was not inspected by the people involved in this report. We did make that determination. Um, I don't know if MMS has um, a random drug test program for their inspectors. Perhaps Ms. Birnbaum would be able to answer that for you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. We appreciate your patience. Our third panel, or, uh, yeah, our third panel today. It's composed of the following individuals, Rear Admiral James Watson, Deputy Unified Area Command on the Deepwater Horizon Fire and MC-252 oil spill with the U.S. Coast Guard, Dr. Jane Lubchenco, the Undersecretary of Commerce for Oceans and Atmosphere and NOAA Administrator, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, U.S. Department of Justice, and Mrs. F S. Elizabeth Birnbaum, the Director of the Minerals Management Service, U.S. Department of Interior. 